Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report. Wherever you get your podcast, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. Today, I'm joined by ESPN NFL Draft Analyst Jordan Reed as we talk about the Commander's Draft. And I know it's a couple weeks old now, but I still think it's important to go to hear from a national perspective about the Commander's Draft. Jordan Reed studies this for a living. He lives this thing for 11 months out of the year, folks. And I get into a little bit about what his schedule is like and when he starts going over these guys and the work that goes into it. So just so you know, you have some context when he starts talking about these players, how deep his knowledge is. But that's why I want to bring him on. And within that context, I also asked him a question. Would he have drafted Will Levis when he was sitting there at 16, knowing what he knows about the commanders and Sam Howell and what else is available? I would have done what the commanders did. I would have taken Emmanuel Forbes. No problems with that at all. And I, I believe Sam Howell is going to be good enough that you don't need to take a guy like Will Levis. So, But I asked uh, Jordan Reed that question, too, because I wanted to hear his input. Also, within that, he, he brought up Jacoby Brissett at one point when – and now listen, I would tell, I would say this too. Don't sleep on Jacoby Brissett. The only thing that Hall is guaranteed is the first crack of the job. He's not guaranteed to start at the, uh, at the beginning of the season. So if he doesn't show what the coaches want, then you have Jacoby Brissett will definitely challenge him. And I think this is a good situation because you have a guy that can clearly challenge Hall. And if it makes Hall better, this team is better. And if Hall, if the coaches don't believe Hall is ready, then you have a hell of an insurance policy. So it's a it's so in that regard, it's a it's a not a bad spot. And for a young guy, he will have to go out and earn it. He's not going to just be handed the job. So just know that. Now, before I play my conversation conversation with Jordan Reed, one a couple of cool things. Don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. We had a big story the other day about all the sale news and just what are the next steps. So if you haven't read that, you can go check that out. Also, I've been asked a few times about, has Chase Young been showing up? Has Chase Young been showing up? Montez Sweat, has he shown up? Well, they haven't been here in the last couple of weeks. That, that much I know. I know they're working out. I know these are voluntary. So I'm just answering the question that a few people have asked. Again, it's voluntary. I think one thing I do think that the coaches would love to see those guys here next, not this coming week, but the following week when they could start going out in the field and actually going through practice sessions uh, in OTAs. And keep in mind, they lost an OTA week because of some violations from how they handled practices last year. And they were also, Ron Rivera was also fined $100,000. But I think the loss of that time, I think it makes makes it so that you, you need to maximize the two weeks of OTA sessions you do have. And then they'll have um, a, a week of, of mini camp as well. And the, that mini camp is mandatory. So clearly, if you're not here at that time, that's a big deal. I think uh, the next couple of weeks, you would like to see guys, if if you want to be considered a team leader, I think you show up for those things. But again, the key is, do you show up in shape? Do you show up? Do you produce? And I think that's going to be all, that's always, always, always the key. And when you look back on these things too, that's always the key. But I do know, listen, we know that one of the things that Ron Rivera talked about with, with Chase Young was commitment. And part of that commitment for him was showing up to these workouts. So Again, voluntary. And when I asked someone over there, the first thing they said was, these are voluntary. And I, and I agree. So not making a big deal, but just wanted to answer that question. So anyway, that's it for me. Let's get to my conversation with ESPN NFL draft analyst, Jordan Reed. The adventure park is zip lining through the trees. It's climbing from platform to platform. It's even an ax throwing competition with your friends. But what the adventure park really is, is opportunity, reconnecting with friends and family, accomplishing a challenge, and making lasting memories. So book your visit today and choose your own adventure. Jordan, first of all, thanks for coming on. I know how busy you guys get. And by the way, like when you've already started working on 2024, so when are you actually going to take a little time to maybe take a deep breath? Uh, so June is when my vacation comes just because I like to get a lot of the early 2024 20, names out of the way just so I can have a basis to work off of going into the season. So that's what May consists of. But when June gets here, that's when I'll 
take a step away from the film, recharge the battery. And then when July hits, that's really when a lot of things pick up for football. And then when August gets here, you know, we're full steam ahead then. So when you're starting, just before I get into the other stuff, because I do like to have people understand what you guys do. So when you start going, diving into film, like how many are you, how many guys are you watching even in July on a daily basis? So we get a senior list just because we know those are the guys that are likely or that are coming out next year. So you want to go ahead and get a head start on those seniors. And it's mostly the top ranked seniors that are coming out. So there's probably about 100 to 125 guys that you feel good about as far as who could go very early on. And you're watching, you know, maybe three to four games at the most just to get an idea about those players. And then you're working your way through um, some of the top ranked underclassmen like, you know, Kayla Williams of USC quarterback, USC Drake May. The big quarterbacks, Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver, Ohio State, those big names that you know that are likely to come out, barring something unforeseen happening. So just trying to get a feel for who they are as players, just so you can track them throughout the year. So when do you and how many, you know, how many other people are you talking to, whether it's people at the schools, scouts or whatever? How often are you start? When do you start talking to them or do you like or do you want to get your own opinion before you talk to anybody? I always like to get my own opinion just because there can be some things that you form before watching those players. And that's something that you never want to do in scouting. You want to form your own opinion, right. get a feel for those players. But while I'm on vacation in June, that's when I'll start to make calls and start to talk to people who I trust and get some more information about those players. So you're working on vacation. Pretty much. <laughs> okay, well, I, said, I can respect that because my wife will say like, well, yeah, I, yeah. She knows what that looks like when, but um, but yeah, so, but that's what I mean, because I think sometimes people don't realize just the amount of work that goes into what you guys do and that it's not just, um, you know, sitting back watching nothing and not talking to anybody, it's doing all of it. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's a long process. Yeah, it is. And scouting is a 12 month job and it, it really gets famous or I should say popular from January through right. April, obviously, but this is a 12 month job for us of where we're watching guys talking to people and then forming our own opinions about these players, too. So let's get to the commander's draft since this was and it's been a couple of weeks. Um, but I am curious your initial impressions on the draft class. And I was looking at, you know, you had your rankings from one to like 379. And, you know, I, I'm not sure that the rounds they took these guys in always matched where you felt like these guys were. So anyways, I'm curious what in general you thought about their draft. I thought it was solid overall, and I thought they hit some positions of need. The one that I thought they would hit was offensive tackle, which they didn't get to, depending on how you're feeling about Braden Daniels. Now, I was going to ask you I, about him about that. Yeah, <laughs> I knew that question was coming, so we'll get into him here in a second but overall I thought it was solid we knew they had to get a corner somehow some way and they addressed it really early with Emmanuel Forbes and this was one of their biggest weaknesses in the secondary we knew they need they had a need opposite of Benjamin St. Juice who was a really good find for them in the third round a few years ago getting him with Emmanuel Forbes now you have a very young tandem that has a very bright future and I think they needed to get a player that could get some turnovers just because yes. that's what they lacked last year. Only had nine interceptions, I believe it was, which was the fourth lowest in the league a season ago. Emmanuel Forbes cures that right away with 14 career interceptions, six career pick sixes, which is an FBS record. So, you know, walking through the door, he's going to help you with your turnover production. So that was one of the biggest reasons why I felt they had him over somebody like a Christian yes. Gonzalez Definitely. or other, other corners that were on the board just because of the ball skills in the turnover production. And that's something, you know, that Ron Rivera has talked about endlessly about how we need to get better with getting the ball back to the offense, just getting some turnover. So Forbes helps that right away. The next two picks were two of my favorite players in the okay. entire draft. Okay. And, and with, with Jartavius Martin, I, I thought he was a home run selection okay. for them. He was one of my favorite prospects just because he satisfies so many different needs in the secondary. He can play safety. He can play nickel. He can play outside corner. There's so many different hats that he can wear, which is what he showed at Illinois. He's a fantastic athlete. At the Senior Bowl, there were some scouts that were happy that he got hurt after the first day just really? so he could stay hidden. Just so he could stay hidden those last two days, they thought he was going to blow up just because he was going to play so well. Mm -hmm. Those final two practices at the Senior Bowl, but an area where he's going to help them tremendously is special teams. He's an A-plus special teams player, especially when you're talking about a player that's going to help you in so many different areas. So he's going to check a box. In the secondary, he's going to help you there. 
but also you're getting tremendous value as a special teams player too. So, and the character's off the charts too. So big fan of Jartavius Martin. I think he's going to be a day one player for them, whether it's a special teams or in the secondary, eventually he's going to be a key contributor, whether it's early in the season, midway through the season, mark my words, he's going to be a really good player for the commanders. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. After that, Ricky Stromberg was another player that I was a big fan of. Um, got an opportunity to see him out in Las Vegas at the East West Shrine Bowl. I thought he had a really, really good week there. And, with him, he's kind of an interesting evaluation just because he's not a overwhelming type of center as far as it's going to overpower people, but he just does the dirty work. And then while it's not always pretty, he just gets his job done, which is what you ask for at that position. You just want somebody that's competent. And they've had competent players at the position before, but players have just battled injuries at center. Right. They had a lot of turnover there. And I saw that they recently released Chase Rulier, who right. showed some promise early on, but injuries has just... Uh, really derailed his career but with Stromberg he's a player that has a ton of experience five-year player at Arkansas he's played guard and center so if it were me I put him out there week one as a starter <clears throat> excuse me at center I think that highly of him I think he's a plug-and-play starter and I think that's why they played him or excuse me that's why they drafted him so early on in the third round if you if you take a player that early on day two you're probably expecting him to eventually develop into a starter or some type of key contributor for you early on so uh, I think the world of Rulier, I, I think he's going to be a really good player. And while it's not always pretty with him, he just gets the job done. And <laughs> excuse me, losing my voice here over the past few days. Um, but some of the other players, just looking down the list, uh, KJ Henry, I, I think he's another player that doesn't have a very high ceiling. But as far as a developmental rotational type of player, I think he's going to help him. Maybe not immediately, but we know. With, with Washington, they have a lot of players that are going to be free agents this upcoming season. Yeah. I think they have four players at defensive end that are going to be free agents with uh, Chase Young, Montez Sweat, James Smith-Williams, and then uh, one player I'm missing. Yeah, Casey Tuhill, he's, he's also going to be a free agent. So K.J. Henry is a young uh, developmental piece that doesn't have a super high ceiling, but as far as a player that can come in and play 10 to 12 reps a game uh, that you feel good about, I, I think he can help you walk through the door. So going, what about like Chris Rodriguez from Kentucky running back? He's, he seems to be a very, obviously a powerful runner, um, good one cut at, you know, he's a decisive runner, it seems. So what did you think about him? And they also, yeah. look, before I, before you answer, they do think that he can develop into more of a threat as a third down, as a receiver, as a receiver out of the backfield as well. I think that was one of the biggest questions about him just because Kentucky didn't really use him that right. way. So they used him as that between the tackles banger, that downhill guy, which I think he's what that's what he's going to be on the next right. level. You, you just have better options out of the backfield. Brian Robinson's a better catcher. Antonio Gibson's a better catcher. So I don't see a situation of where they need to force him into that third down row, especially when you have better players already uh, that can satisfy that role. So, you know, first, second down, I think it's a down the do line thing. I think it's yeah, a down yeah, the yeah. line thing for them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Um, but you just have some better players from a receiving standpoint, and I don't think they just need to force him into that role. But that's not a situation of where he can't do it. I just think he's better or he provides better value as a runner right away just because, I mean, right. he's a bigger back. Uh, he can run between the tackles. You don't really want to run him on the perimeter a ton just because he's more of that downhill, right. get those tough yards type of player. So that's probably the role he's going to satisfy walking through the door or initially for them but as far as some third down aspects yes he can do it but it's just not a role you want to see him consistently doing it just because I think they have better players that can they that right. can maximize that role a little bit better yeah and I think when, when I say that I think that's a probably a year from now developing into that because Gibson's a free agent and if you don't keep him maybe you have another guy who can at least be a threat on three downs I don't think he'll I don't think he'd be a third down guy per se but maybe a threat so anyways but the other guy Andre Jones another another um defensive end um guy that they took in the last round what did you what are your thoughts on him yeah I mean true true pass rusher which is something that they need then you're hoping to get something out of him as a seventh round pick with those guys you're just taking a flyer on players that late athletic you're just hoping you can get something out of them there just isn't a lot of snaps for him initially. Right. Uh, let's say if he does make the 53-man roster, it's just – it's an uphill battle for him just because the one position where Washington is loaded at for this season is defensive line. I, I think that's one yeah. of the strongest points, not only on defense, but throughout the roster too. So there just isn't a lot of snaps for him. So maybe he's a practice squad guy where you can stash and hope to develop him. But as far as uh, making the 53, it's just going to be an uphill battle for him just because there isn't a lot of room or a lot of right. roster spots for that position right now. 
So let's go back to Forbes because I think you had him as a, as your sixth ranked corner. Now I only say that because so many of those corners were in that same spot that it really depended on what's your scheme, what's your fit, what are you looking for between like he and and, and Joey Porter and Banks and all that. So what is it what what is it that makes him a good ball hawk? Do you think? Uh, it's just his poise at the catch point. He's very comfortable with finding and playing the ball in the air. And then also he's just in the right place at the right time. A lot of times the interceptions sometimes can be luck. And that's not to say that a lot of his picks ended up being that way, but there were some situations of where there were some tip passes and he was able to make plays on them. But the great thing about Forbes is that whenever he catches the ball, he turns into a return specialist. He's trying to get six points the other way, which I think is a special gift that he does have and something that Washington does need. Now, I think the most interesting aspect to watch about this entire fit is that Forbes really excels in man coverage Mm -hmm. and Washington plays predominantly zone coverage. So maybe the zone snaps that they saw during his time at Mississippi State, it gives them a lot of uh, intrigue or promise that they feel as if um, he can be better in that aspect just because he was decent in zone coverage, but man coverage is really where he thrived in at Mississippi State. So I think that's going to be one of the bigger aspects and one of the biggest keys to watch as far as his his potential moving forward, just because he's going to have to learn to play zone a little bit better. And I think they liked how he played, how he used his eyes when they saw him in zone too. And I think that was a key for them. But yeah, you're right. It's funny because like somebody else told me like, oh, well, he got some of those picks on – a tip pass and bad throws like, yeah, that's true. That is true. But he's always there. And that play against Kentucky was phenomenal. Yeah. You know, I think there was one against Tulsa too, where it's, you know, it's just positioning yourself in the right spot, but also understanding. I think he seems to understand tendencies rather well. Yeah. He's, he's very savvy. Um, he's a read and react type of corner and he trusts what his eye sees. And that's exactly what happened against Kentucky where he was coming downhill on the screen and he just intercepted it. It was like Will Levis was intending to throw it to him. <laughs> he got there uh, before the receiver was even able to react on it. That's something that we're going to see in Forbes's career. And he's kind of a, a little bit of Jekyll and Hyde with that. And it's kind of like what, if you remember what Mar- Marcus Peters was coming out of mm-hmm. Washington of where there's going to be some plays of where he's going to get beat, but there's going to be some other plays of where he's going to make a big play for you. So there's going to be a little bit of Jekyll and Hyde. I think of a transition period with him just because he's a bit of a gambler, but you would rather a corner be that type of player as opposed to playing too hesitant on the ball. So I would rather take a player that's a bit of a gambler as opposed to somebody that just sits back and waits on some things. But also another interesting aspect that I wanted to bring up about Forbes is just the frame, Um, him being 166 pounds. I think that's something that gave some other teams a little bit hesitancy Mm -hmm. Um, with taking him, that was one of my biggest hesitancies with him, just the frame. Um, we really haven't seen a cornerback succeed uh, having that weight, but with his playing style, he plays very physical. He'll come downhill and he'll tackle. He can strike. He can do a lot of those things. So we'll see how he does end up holding up. And he didn't miss any games at Mississippi right. State. So credit to him. So we saw Washington was very comfortable with it, but I just think that's an aspect that we have to bring up. It's just a durability okay. aspect and see how that holds up moving forward. Absolutely. And and the funny thing is, if he had been 185, he's probably going in the top 10 with that. Production. Oh, without question. So they don't <laughs> get him question. if he's 185. So I think they should be happy that he's that. And they can add some weight. And, and you know, he also plays very fast to the ball in the run game or in, in the you know screens and all that, which I wonder how much that can help him, like maybe beat defenders to the spot or beat blockers to the spot, whatever. And if that can be a bone, if his speed and reaction can be um, off help, help offset some of that weight issue i wonder yeah i think it will uh especially it's going to be a bit of a transition period for him just like any rookie he's going to have to adjust to the speed of the game but once he gets it down i think it'll be just fine so speaking of will levis he was sitting there at 16 now i know they weren't going to take him but i'm curious what your thoughts are on him and especially compared to what you know they they like sam howell they're going with sam howell but they also have jacoby Brissett, and i don't think they'd hesitate if Brissett looks better to, to go to him, I don't think. But you know the quarterback situation. You know Will Levis. What would you have done there? Uh, I mean, I would stay, Pat, um, okay. honestly, just because I wasn't super high on Will Levis going into it. And Washington seems to feel good about yeah, the quarterback situation with Sam Howe. They seem to be very high on him. Uh, I was surprised that he lasted until the fifth round, honestly. I had a third-round grade on him coming out. So I was really surprised that he lasted as long as he did. But Jacoby Brissett, 
this is a player that I think can be a starter in the NFL. We saw what he was able to do yeah. in Cleveland last year. He kept that ship afloat while Deshaun Watson was coming back from the suspension. So Jacoby Brissett is a player that has won a lot of games in the NFL. He's an upper echelon backup um, borderline starter in the NFL. So even if Sam doesn't work out, they're hedging their bet having Jacoby in his back pocket. So I really like the the situation of what they're entering with quarterback. And let's see what Sam has before we bring another young quarterback into the building. But like I said, I love that they hedge their bet and getting high quality insurance with somebody like Jacoby Brissett, just because if Sam doesn't look the part, let's say the first four or five games, you pull the plug and then you put Jacoby out there. We know that he's at least going to be competent. Right, right. And I think that was a big factor for them. And, you know, I don't, I think the quarterback they liked was Hendon Hooker. If they were going to go to a guy, but you're probably talking third round for him in their eyes, like you're not going to force it. But if he's sitting there in the third round, it's tremendous value. Thing is, like he was never going to get to where they were picking right. in the third round because everybody else knows he's tremendous value. What did you think of him? Yeah, I was a big fan of Hooker. Now, the first round talk, I never really believed it, honestly, just because of the age factor. The offense that he played in was right. very often or college centric, I should say. And then also the ACL, you have to factor right. that into. I just didn't see a pathway for him to go uh, in the first round. I always thought he was going to go late second, early third round. That's where I kept him at in most of my mock drafts. Um, but uh, the talent, I mean, the talent is tremendous. I think he has plenty of arm talent. Uh, he's mobile. And then also he's really smart. Dad was a quarterback at North Carolina a and He's in the Hall of Fame there. So he's been a quarterback through and through all of his life. He understands how to play the position, has that quiet confidence and charisma that you love to see at the position. So I always thought he was going to end up going somewhere in the top 75 to 100 picks. But first round was just a little bit too rich for me. I never really believed right. that. But as far as the player, uh, I think he's a really good developmental piece. Um, but we'll see what he does have. Detroit is it's really interesting just because they have Goff, um, who had a really good year last year. So there really isn't a pathway for him to become a starter right away, which could be a good thing for him. He could sit back and develop while the, the ACL continues to improve or get healthy. But if Goff doesn't show um, some of the similar things that he showed last year, maybe he ends up playing a little bit earlier than expected. You think Howell can be an effective starter? And we talked about this earlier this year, yeah. but I want to get, I don't know if there's, sometimes you, you know, over several months, you your opinions change or form differently or whatever, but what do you think, can he be an effective starter in the NFL? Yeah, I think so. I just don't think Sam is ever going to be in that upper tier, that upper echelon, like top 12 to 15. I just don't think he's ever going to be in that type of tier. But I mean, he has all the arm strength in the world. Um, he had to overcome a lot during his last season at yeah. Carolina. Uh, he lost a lot. And then his rushing yards went up significantly during his during his last season when he was at Carolina. So um, what I'm most interested to see is just how his skill set aligns with Eric Bieniemy's system. I think yeah. a lot of things that they were running in Kansas City, he's going to be able to operate just because of the arm strength and the accuracy that he does have. But coming from that RPO-centric offense while he was at Carolina is going to be a little bit of an adjustment period for him. So having a new system, uh, a great offensive coordinator in his corner, uh, like Eric Bieniemy, we've seen this, what the system has been able to do uh, in Kansas City and the results that they have had. But Patrick Mahomes didn't come over with him right. <laughs> to no, Washington, obviously. So there's right. a different person operating it. So let's see how efficient Sam is able to operate it, how quick of a decision maker that he can be. But also the pressure's on with him initially, um, with Jacoby being behind him. Yeah. So we'll see if, if he's going to step up to the challenge. It's absolutely a great yeah. thing. So I we'll be able to see right away. We'll be able to see very quickly just how well he's able to operate it. I want to ask you on two more players from the draft and then one kind of overarching NFC East thing. But Martin, you, you talked about him, one of your favorites. When you were able to play that many spots in the secondary, you're a pretty smart player. So, But what do you see in him? What enabled him – to use that skill because they're also going to use them in that Buffalo nickel role, the kind of a hybrid role as well. At times they would use him there. So what did you see in his skill set that allows him to play multiple roles? Well, it's just the smarts, the awareness that he plays with. And then he's seen the game from so many different lenses, which is going to help him a lot moving on to the next level, just because, I mean, we'll see what happens with Kendall Fuller. Um, I think he has more upside than Fuller at nickel. 
So if they want to move on from him eventually, I think Martin eventually could take over that role. But also if they want to leave him in the back end with Cam Curl, who I think is a really underrated yeah. player, you can mix and match those guys on the back end just because either one of them could play high safety or they could come down and play that slot nickel role or that Buffalo nickel role, as you mentioned. So just the versatility that he has, but also he unlocks a lot of different people in the secondary just because – he kind of plays like Javon Holland in a sense. Mm. Um, just remember Javon Holland when Brian Flores was there in Miami with Holland being able to mix and match and play so many different areas. It really helped unlock the versatility of so many different areas of different players of where you can mix and match those players too. So he's kind of a player that you really are able to unlock the skill set of not only him, but also you can use a lot of different players in a, a variety of different roles. So I think he can be that player that really unlocks a lot of, um, characteristics or traits of other players on the back end too. Agree. And I also, I liked watching how Illinois use their defensive backs last year and how often they could disguise coverages, et cetera. The other guy is, is Daniels, Braden Daniels, because, you know, a lot of people seem to be high on him, higher on him as a guard. I know that these guys would like to try him at tackle initially just to see. So what do you think? Why do you think he's more suited to being a guard? And by the way, I agree with, that like when you watch him as a tackle, sometimes it was it was very up and down. Um, but yeah. why do you think he'd be better as a guard? And what do you think? Well, let's start with that. Why do you think he'd be better as a guard? Just the athleticism. Uh, I think his athleticism can really be on display at guard. And I just think it's much easier of a transition based on what he showed at Utah. I thought he's more consistent at guard just mm -hmm. because I think you're spot on. I think his tape was kind of up and down at tackle. And especially when you're talking about protecting the backside of a young quarterback, you don't want that uncertainty going into the season or eventually, uh, it, let's say he overtakes Charles Leno, you don't want that type of uncertainty. And I know Leno isn't the future there long term anyway at left tackle, but he's played a lot of snaps at left tackle. So me personally, I would feel better about having Leno there, but also now you have a potential Norwell replacement too, uh, depending on where you want right. to play. Braden Daniels. So I like him a little bit better at guard just because he's young, he's cheap. And then you have a develop potential developmental piece to eventually overtake Norwell. But also they the interior of this offensive line is really in flux. So it's kind of yeah. like let's just put some of these guys' names in a hat, pull one out, and let's just see how they do. Well, and it is, and like Sam Cosme is going to be the right guard. And and yeah. you know, you, you talk about Stromberg, and they did sign Nick Gates to be the starting center. And so, but eventually you draft a guy in the third round, that's your future center. Um, and then I think with Daniels, it feels like the, the idea is you have Leno for this year. And then if Daniels develops, maybe you can move on from, from him, or maybe you can put him at right tackle and put Wiley at left guard. There's there, but so it is, there are a lot of questions about the line still. Um, but how much, cause he was like, Daniels was, you know, he showed, he would show some things with his footwork at tackle. And then other times it's like, it would trip him up. So what did you see was the big issue for him at tackle? Just play strength. And then just trying to do a little bit too much at times. And that happens a lot when you're so athletic, you try to beat everybody to the punch and it results in you being really out of control. And he results in being what's called a waist bender. So he'll punch his hands really hard and then he'll just be out of control. So just playing with more poise with his hands more control and then it's okay to be violent uh, at the point of attack but sometimes he just overdoes it a lot right and that's what you saw a lot on his tape so which is it, i wouldn't say it's an easy fix but it's something that is correctable over time and i think that's why one of the biggest biggest reasons why he ended up going in the fourth round as opposed to a little bit earlier just trying to control those hands a little bit more but the athleticism is off the charts we saw what he was able to do at the yeah. combine i thought he was one of the best movers during the positional drills at the combine too so the athleticism is already there which creates a baseline and a foundation to build upon with him, which is great. That's exactly what you want with the offensive right. lineman. And by the way, they will move on from Norwell at some point, probably soon. So, cause they, cause that is, that was, but that's still a position in flux. Um, the, the Eagles, I know you were pretty high on their draft too. What did you like about their draft? And obviously they took a lot of names that we know, you know, from, from the SEC. Yeah. What did you <laughs> like about what they did? And, did they separate themselves even more from the rest of the division after this draft? Well, I wouldn't say they separated themselves. I think they really build on the foundation that they already had. And I don't blame Howie Roseman for what he's doing. We talked about that Georgia defense from 2021 as arguably one of the best ever. Why not bring some of those pieces over that you already have in place? Those guys already have chemistry together. And I thought 
the Eagles was the best landing spot for Jalen Carter. I didn't know if he was going to make it to them. They had the 10th pick. They ended up trading to nine to get him. I didn't know if he was going to fall that far. But of all the teams in the top 10, assuming that he ended up going in the top 10, which he did, I thought the Eagles was the best spot for him without question, just because you have a great mentor right there in Fletcher Cox already that will be beside him every snap, who's a proven veteran uh, that can guide him along the way until the Eagles do away with him. Um, you have Jordan Davis, who was a former teammate of his. They've had success together. They've been in a room together at Georgia. And then you have N'Kobe Dean, who was a player that was behind him when they won a national title together. So they have a lot of pieces that are already in place. And then you have another roommate that I like to call him or draft mate with him and Nolan Smith. They were on the same defensive line together. So all these pieces are in place for him to succeed. Now it's really just up to Jalen as far as how good he wants to be. But their draft overall, I thought it was really good. Um, I called them the Philadelphia Bulldogs <laughs> just because it seems like they were just looking at the Georgia players on the draft board. And uh, I mean, a program like that is really hard to argue what Howie Roseman is doing with getting players from that program. Um, then last thing, uh, Dallas Giants, how'd you feel like in general, how'd you feel about their drafts? I thought the Giants did a really good job. I thought the positions of need really matched the value on the draft board. John Michael Schmitz, I thought was a home run selection for him. I thought he was the best center. In the draft class, Deontay Banks was one of my favorite corners in the draft class. I had him as the number three guy behind Gonzalez and Witherspoon. I thought it was better than Joey Porter Jr. I think he's going to be a better pro than Joey Porter Jr. too. And then Jalen Hyatt adding that speed to the wide receiver room, I think that's going to help them a lot. Um, Dallas, I thought it was a steady draft for the most part. They had a huge need at nose tackle. I think Mozzie Smith is going to be able to step yeah. in right away and really help that defensive line. They're loaded. At edge rusher, Micah Parsons is going to be playing defensive end full-time now, and we know how good of a player he is. But Mozzie Smith, he's that enforcer along the mirror, uh, along the middle, excuse me, that can be that plugger in the middle. It's really hard to move him off the point of attack. He needs to get better as far as a pass rusher. But uh, I think that's something that they're going to be able to develop into him eventually. But they're, they're, the draft was solid overall. I apologize. This is the last thing. So if how doesn't <laughs> work out, and if something, there's staff changes, how deep – is this quarterback class in 24? So I'm still working my way through um, the quarterback class, but we know the two names at the top, yeah. Caleb Williams of USC, and then also Drake May right. of North Carolina. Things will have to go really, really bad for Washington <laughs> to be in contention yeah. <laughs> for either yeah. one of those guys. But on paper, it looks like a deep quarterback class just because this is the class of where a lot of seniors went back to school and used right. that extra year or they were a graduate transfer and went in the, the, the transfer portal and used that extra year. So you're talking about Michael Penix of Washington, Bo Nix of Oregon, J.J. McCarthy of Michigan, and also Quinn Ewers of Texas, who's one of the younger players uh, at the position in this year's draft class. So it looks deep initially, but we know with quarterbacks, things change very, very quickly throughout the year. There could be somebody that comes out of nowhere, like we saw over the past few years. Joe Burrow is a great example of yeah. that so it, it looks deep initially maybe not necessarily at the top or in the first round but I think we're going to see a lot of guys go day two a day three just because of those those super seniors that came back or those guys that use that extra year of the transfer portal all right Jordan let, w tell people where they can find you they, they should know you by now they should be following you but Twitter Instagram I know you have a big presence on both so you can find me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Reed that's J-O-R-D-A-N uh, underscore R-E-I-D you can also find me on uh, ESPN Plus alongside my colleagues, Mel Kuyper Jr., Ty McShay, and also Matt Miller. We're still doing some reflective pieces as far as draft classes. I have um, a quarterback piece that's coming out in the next week or so, uh, just just examining which quarterbacks are going to provide value and then just their role initially. And then where are they going to be five years from now as far as are they going to be starters uh, continuing to be backups or floating around somewhere on another team. So be on the lookout for that. And then things get a little bit quiet in the month of July, or excuse me, the month of June for us. But July and then August is when things really pick back up for us from a draft content perspective. Awesome. Jordan, appreciate it very much. You're the best. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks to Jordan for joining me and thank you as always for tuning in. I'll be back with another episode Tuesday night on the podcast, Wednesday morning on the video, as we continue to look at some of the players that the commanders have drafted. I'll talk to you next time.